Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the CCH and Maddox uh, sponsored session today. Um, it's my privilege uh, to uh, to be your chairman uh, for this afternoon's discussion going through to e early evening. I'm Andrew McLaughlin, for any of those who, you do, who don't know me. Um, there's plenty about me on the bio list, so I won't go through it right now um, and leave you to try and figure that out uh, in the detail as to um, my origins and background. Um, suffice to say, though, we've got a, a terrific group of um, presentations coming from uh, four presenters here today. Um, I won't, um, I'll, I'll actually do the uh, announcements in relation to the bios as each speaker is coming up rather than trying to overload you right now. Um, the, there are a couple of housekeeping matters that I'd just like to go through with you right now um, to save embarrassment later on for you or for me. Um, one of them would be to place your mobiles on silent. Either that will make them really loud so we know who you are and not to invite next time. The next thing I'd like to go through is um, questions and interaction. Uh, I've had a chat with the panel uh, and the pre panel presenters. You can look at them either way if you like. Um, they're quite happy to take questions and to be interrupted on the way through. I've certainly advised them that I will probably do that if I think there's something that needs to be expanded upon or something that's a point of interest that you may like to know more about. So please feel free, I will be. And the panel members have also suggested they're going to do that as well uh, through the presentation, so it keeps it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, in that regard, if you have a question from the floor, um, please just put your hand up and wait until the microphone comes to you, because we'd actually like to be able to ensure that the question is heard properly for the benefit of the people who will be watching on the webcast. So uh, that would be greatly appreciated if you would do that. Um, if, um, if you would prefer, obviously there's the interactive approach in the new modern world of um, social media and all that sort of thing, which I don't pretend to be an expert on, but if you put your questions through there, through the magic of modern technology, I will get them up here uh, and um, I can decide whether or not I disclose your name. No, I'm just kidding, I won't disclose names, I, I will just hand the question over. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, that's going to be St Stephen Green. Um, Stephen, for those of you who have the pleasure of meeting, Stephen's a lovely guy. Uh, he used to be the head of uh, tax at uh, ANZ Group. Uh, I've dealt with Stephen quite a lot over the years, uh, sometimes uh, more surreptitiously than other times, Stephen, uh, in this particular role and in my banking and finance roles historically. Stephen's a world place to talk about tax risk management, having been at the forefront of uh, a lot of uh, cooperative design around administrative processes with the tax office. And sometimes, Stephen, I think it's fair to say that it's um, probably cost you more than you won out of it at different points. But overall, I think um, the approaches that Stephen's adopted uh, in relation to his time at ANZ have been used uh, and, and have been incorporated in other elements of um, compliance practice uh, within the ATO. Uh, I could talk, long, talk longer about Stephen, but I think he's a better place to uh, speak for himself and to talk on the subject of tax risk management. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I guess I have the, uh, the privilege of being the first speaker, and so I'm able to um, set the agenda somewhat for the other speakers. So um, hopefully their notes are compatible with mine, but if, if they're not, I guess they'll have to change when they hear what I have to say. Um, the, the, the topic is, um, is building a tax risk management framework. So, so I thought I would start out by, um, by, by ta taking a helicopter view drawn from my own experience at, at ANZ and elsewhere in the industry over, over many years um, to, to really set out the building blocks that you must take or you should take into account in, in building your own framework. <clears throat> now. I think where where I would start is with um, with an appreciation of what is corporate governance. Um, now I've, I've got a couple of quotes on what is corporate governance here. The, the first one is from the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Um, I think a couple of years ago, it's still valid today. It's 
it's quite a big picture view, but you can read it there on the slide. It's, it's um, the role of persons or organisations with responsibility for overseeing the strategic direction of the entity. And, and that really means the board. Right? The board is there to set the strategic direction. And the second limb of what the Institute thinks is, is um, uh, relates to obligations related to the accountability of the entity. And that's where we get to management, is that really addresses the, the detail and the processes that are required. So the Institute's talking about two limbs there. Um, it is a fairly high level concept statement, but it, but it does, uh, what you can draw out from that is that corporate governance affects the entire organisation. Now, there are lots and lots of, of um, definitions of corporate governance around. You, you can search around and find lots of them. I, I've only pulled out two. So the second one I've pulled out is from the ATO itself. And this probably is the one that resonates a little more with, um, with those that are working at the coalface of tax. So you can read it there. It's talking about the, the, the a framework of rules and relationships and systems and processes. Um, um, it talks about how risk is monitored and assessed and how performance is optimised. Um, it's a more practical concept of corporate governance, but again, you can see that it means something that's spread across the whole organisation, relevant to the entire organisation. Now, just staying with that theme, I, I can draw from, from what I've just mentioned from those two slides that the scope of corporate governance is enterprise-wide. Is enterprise -wide. So corporate governance has to be led from the top, but it's embedded throughout the organisation. It shapes, and this is quite important, it shapes the organisation's culture and it signals the expected behaviours expected from the board and across the, the whole organisation. And I think, my view is that the tax risk management framework that's, that's put in place must follow those core principles. <clears throat> now, um, this is another quote from the Institute. It just drops down another level. And it talks about um, well, the evolution of the roles of board and along with um, the, the relevant committees of the board, audit and risk committees it talks about here. And if you look at this particular quote, it mentions the word risk four times. So it's, it's the role of boards has led to a greater need for insight into key risks and understanding of how these risks are being managed and greater assurance over key risks facing an organisation. So it, it really is saying, in other words, in different words, it's saying you must know what your risk appetite in your organisation is. What, do, what does the board, really the board, want to set as the organisation's risk appetite? The words are quite compatible, they're, they're expressed differently, but they're quite compatible with the ATO's view about corporate governance that you saw on the previous slide. And it, whilst it mentions risks in, in um, four occasions, as I've said, um, it, it doesn't go to any particular types of risks, so it's generic, but it must include tax risks. It clearly does include tax risks. <clears throat> So from that, we, we, we get to the point where um, a tax risk management framework that's built must fit in with a company's corporate governance, whatever that corporate governance statement or principles might be. So the tax risk governance framework that's built uh, should reflect the cultural and behavioural expectations conveyed by the board. I think it should follow the company's risk appetite that's conveyed and set by the board. It so, should. Steve, can I ask yeah. you a question? Yep. 
in the, in the tax context, what do you mean by risk appetite? Can you give us an example of that? Um, well, um, it, it's a qualitative term, but, or it's a qualitative notion, but it's really about um, what level of, of um, danger, I suppose, would the board want to take with, with the company's balance sheet? What level of conservatism or, or, or aggressiveness would the board want to take with the with the balance sheet, and you could you could visualise it across a spectrum. If you if you if you visualise a line, a spectrum with low risk at one end and high risk at the other end, somewhere across that spectrum, the board will say, "This is where on that continuum we wish to be, and we don't wish to ex exceed that." It won't necessarily be at the bottom. It won't necessarily be at the top. Somewhere across that spectrum, you need to clarify with the board and with top management, what level of risk this organisation is prepared to take. So in the tax context, if you go, if it, does it mean you, if you're at the higher risk end, you be, might be more into aggressive tax planning? Yes, yes, and uh, at the lower risk end, it might be, um, we don't want to uh, knowingly take any position that will result in um, in, a, in a dispute with the ATO or with any other revenue authority for that matter that will likely end up in court. I mean, that's, a, that's the conservative end. Mm. <clears throat> certainly, certainly, at my experience at ANZ, we, um, the, the, the board managed to articulate what the risk appetite was for the organisation. Including for tax? Um, well, then I took those words, the, the, the board's articulation of risk, and um, transplanted those into a tax concept, or tax context, I should say, and took that back to the board and said, is this what you're happy with regarding tax? <clears throat> so just following on from that, Kevin, the, the next point on my slide is that, is that um, we should see a cascading from, the, from a tax strategy strategy that's approved by the board. So, so I would say you need to devise a tax strategy which would, which would include the group's position on risk, on tax risk, take that to the board and have the board sign off on it. That tax strategy is then, you'll see on some later slides, that, that tax strategy is then the basis for developing your tax risk management framework. And I think too that the, the tax risk management framework should also be your gateway to, to building your desired relationship with the revenue authority. So again, back to the board, you know, as part of the tax strategy, what kind of relationship do we want to have with revenue authorities? Do we want to have a particularly adversarial relationship? Do we want to have a very open and transparent relationship? Or somewhere in between? Does the relationship need to be different with the ATO versus the New Zealand Revenue versus um, the State Revenue Office. So why would there be a yeah. difference? Sorry. Okay, can I just check in with you, Stephen? So what you're saying from what, uh, what I understand is that if you look at your overall organisation, mm. then the nature of what you accept as your risk tolerance statement, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, your corporations law requirements and other requirements around risk standard management, risk and mitigation techniques that are required for reporting purposes, you're saying that that should broadly all be the same thing? There's yes, no I reason, am. No reason to separate tax. Correct. That. Correct. Tax is just another risk to be managed across the organisation. So, so and, why would it be different between revenue authorities? Um, it, the broad concept would be the same, but with 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 this revenue authority, you might only pay a million dollars of tax, and this revenue authority you might pay a billion dollars of tax. So you just take a different attitude to, to your approach, depending on what the, the scale of consequence might be. <clears throat> um, now, so moving now to the building blocks for that um, for that framework. I say you must know the scale of your tax risk universe. So you 
get down and understand, depending on what you are, are you, are you an outbound multinational, are you an inbound subsidiary, what kind of organisation are you? But I would say you need to know the profile of all of your taxes that are in your universe. So if you're an outbound multinational, your universe is global. You need to know all of your taxes, all taxes that this organisation is responsible for and deals with globally. If you're an inbound subsidiary, same thing, all, all taxes, state and federal, um, but locally. And I think you need to know, too, not just income tax, but all taxes that flow through the organisation, um, be, they, um, be they operating style taxes or just taxes that, um, that are collected and remitted. So for example, you, you should know not only your profile of income tax, but you should know your profile of GST in gross terms, credit terms, you should know your profile of um, land tax, you should know your profile of employee PAYG and any other tax that your organisation um, has to deal with in your universe. Stephen, as you've, as you've raised this, I've got a question that's just come through. No, I'm kidding. I, I had this question beforehand. But I would like to get questions coming through. I haven't got one. So to prevent me from getting question anxiety, can someone please send through a question? But I will, I will ask this question because it's relevant at the moment. And I will ask Kevin to contribute because the person who asked the question has asked me to do that. So as chair, I'm sorry, Stephen, I'm going to interrupt and ask this okay. question. How can companies strike a balance between maintaining board engagement through the use of a tax risk register, because okay, so that registers the, the concern, and mitigate their fears, real or imagined, that such a tool designed to promote better tax governance may result in increased ATO intention or review activity. Well, you probably preempted the later slide, but um, um, an organisation needs to know its spectrum, its profile of all tax risks. Now, now um, it's true that uh, how, do you, how do you keep track of that? You need to record them in some way or another. Whether that's called a tax risk register or some other document, it's effectively the same thing anyway. Um, and, and it's true that if the um, ATA were to get hold of that, then real or perceived, you might as well write a cheque to the ATO for the tax that's affected by whatever you've got on your risk register. It's, it's real or perceived. I think it's more perceived than real, but, but different people have different views. Um, the, the way to protect that is, there's a couple of ways to protect yourself. One, one, one you sit down and do a deal with the ATO that they, that they shan't access that, uh, that document. Um, another is to, is to um, make sure that it is uh, a document pulled together for reporting to the board and, and you get your, your board protection concession over that, or at least arguably you do. Um, uh, you could, um, you could uh, run it through lawyers along the way and arguably attract legal professional privilege. Or you could do what we did at ANZ and that is um, uh, enter into an, into an ACA and uh, include a, a specific provision in the ACA gr uh, document that uh, precludes the ATO from accessing that document. Do you want me to say a few words about it? Yeah, go for it. Um, the ATO um, is very keen to ensure board, boards ensure that tax risks are being identified and certainly actioned appropriately. So back in 2004, when the Commissioner of the day, Michael Carmody, started writing to boards, he wanted to raise the significance of boards' involvement in tax risk management. And following on that, um, the ATA did issue a, state, a practice statement in 2004, which Stephen alluded to in the sense of saying that it would agree not to access uh, documents which gave advice to board boards on tax risk. I think that's right, Stephen, is it not? Yes. Broadly speaking? Yes. Um, 
Now, a tax re register, as I understand, and Stephen has mentioned, is trying to essentially do that, to identify tax risks and make sure the board of the corporate group uh, is aware of those risks and the board is satisfied that those risks have been managed appropriately. It probably also is used, as I understand it, on a day-to-day -day basis by the tax function within the corporate group. So in that strict sense, it's not solely for advising boards. But I think that probably the intent of the concession the ATO gave around not accessing those documents which give advice to board on tax risks, these registers probably come within the spirit of that concession not to access them other than in exceptional circumstances. Now, I know this issue has been raised with the ATO in recent times and it's under consideration and I expect that there will be something out from the ATO in the near future about that practice statement and saying something about this particular issue. Now, having said what I thought, it probably comes within the spirit or intent of that concession not to access. Um, I think it's also important to know that, you know, you should, if you want to get ATO, a good relationship with the ATO, I think it's important to identify risks in discussions with the ATO. Uh, in some senses, through a pre lodgement compliance review, which some of you are probably are familiar with, um, it should come out of that, some of these risks on the register. I suspect also some of the ones you're required to report under a portable tax position schedule would also be included there. Uh, and as Stephen mentioned, if you have an annual compliance arrangement, an ACA, these issues would come out in any event. So whilst I think probably the ATA might agree not to access these registers as a general rule, a number of the, the relevant risks would come out, you know, I think, in discussions or in disclosure, disclosure to the ATO in any event. But it is an issue which is important to know to people and, uh, and the ATA will be saying something about it specifically, I believe, in the not too distant future. I hope that makes sense. I think um, there is a review of the particular PSLA, 2004 slash 14, uh, so there will be some additional language in the revised um, PSLA um, that people should have regard to when they're thinking about the way in which they put together a, a risk register and the way they deal with the risk register. So you should have regard to that. There will be sections in there that deal with things like exceptional circumstances, that is the circumstances in which the commissioner will access the register. So you need to be aware of those things. It ought to be built into your tax risk framework uh, in terms of the way in which you manage uh, information of that type. Okay. So we... Uh we now we know our tax risk universe. Next step, the next part of the building block, is to ensure that every tax, every single tax in that universe, has an owner. And by that I mean that there is a specified individual or a specified role that has accountability for the day-to-day -day compliance of every tax, and that that individual. Well, that, well, that individual accepts that responsibility and accountability. There should be a function that carries <coughs> identified that carries primary responsibility for the systems and processes that surround that tax, and that the internal tax function should accept ultimately ultimate responsibility for all taxes. Now. That doesn't mean that the internal tax function um, must know the minute detail of every tax. What I mean by that is that, is that the internal tax function must, at a minimum, ensure that every tax is somewhere inside the organisation appropriately managed and being appropriately reported. The, prime, the, the internal tax function should take primary responsibility for the key taxes and I, um, I'll use the language secondary responsibility for the not so key taxes. But ultimately, if the proverbial hits the fan, 
the board or top management is going to point the finger at the head of tax and not the head of payroll for something goes wrong in the PAYG area or um, uh, he will point, they'll point the bone at the head of tax, not the head of property if something goes wrong in the area of land tax or at the very least the board will, will consider that the head of tax has some kind of shared responsibility. So, so I say um, the tax function should accept reality and accept responsibility. Um, next stage, identify the reporting requirements and the reporting expectations for all of those taxes. And that includes the, the type and the frequency of, of the information and the data reporting for each tax. Um, in turn, into the tax function, and it's from other parts of the organisation, the reporting out from the tax function to management and to other stakeholders that might exist. Um, the reporting, this, this reporting I'm talking about should be both internal reporting and external reporting. Um, there will be external reporting from the tax function on occasion to um, organisations like uh, industry regulators, um, perhaps the Bureau of Statistics, things like that. Um, and make sure that you include the reporting requirements and expectations of revenue authorities, be it the ATO or some overseas or state re revenue authority. Um, they're all stakeholders. Having got to this point, document it. Your framework must be documented. Um, the, the, the framework will consist, should consist, I think, of policies, so you may well need certain tax policies set. The organisation probably has some kind of policy um, protocol or pro policy structure, so any tax policy should fit inside that. Um, there should be a statement of roles and responsibilities impacting uh, taxes, so, so we, we know, we, we've, we've got an owner for all the taxes, we know the profile, that needs to be written down so that everybody is, is, is absolutely clear who owns what. Um, there should be official endorsement from the board or from the CFO or an appropriate senior management person for um, your tax policies, and not necessarily for the framework but at least for an overview of the framework. Um, and, and I, and Repeating what I said before, it should all be aligned to the agreed tax strategy and the agreed risk appetite of the organisation. Right, it's documented. You then need to make sure it works. It's, is it producing the outcomes that are expected? So you monitor and you test it on a regular basis um, just to ensure it is, it is generating the right outcomes. And those right outcomes, they're varied to, to, to meet your tax compliance obligations um, for accounting purposes, and that's not just your P&L, but it's your balance sheet, it's your general ledger, it's reconciliations, it's clearing accounts, all that stuff. Um, uh, does it meet the requirements and produce the right outcomes for all internal and external reporting? And this is for every tax, every tax. And the way to monitor and test there are various ways to do it. It doesn't mean that you need an entire army in the tax function. You can employ um, proper tools, reporting tools. You can use internal audit. We used internal audit a lot at ANZ. Use your own resources um, or the statutory auditors. Um, it's a, actually a clever way to get some tax confirmations is, uh, is get the statutory auditors to, to do it as part of their audit. Uh, and then manage, whoops, Take the slide along. Manage and report what you have. So we've embedded the appropriate tax management. Sorry, embed the appropriate tax management mechanisms. Embed the tools. Use tools. Make sure you scale, scale your risks. Focus on the high risk areas, but don't ignore the low risk areas. Um, Preempt the likely areas of interest of revenue authorities, and having preempted them take steps to mitigate and protect and prepare. 
and consistent with your desired relationship with revenue authorities, engage with them. And I think if you can do all of that stuff, then you'll be well on the way to having a decent tax risk management framework in place. Now it's easy, easier, it's easier to say in concept, standing up here, it's quite a lot of work to put in place. In reality, it's a lot of work. And it took us at ANZ many, many years slowly evolving it. But it's, it's, it is quite easy to, to, to build the basics quite fast. Um, I think that's the end of me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stephen. Hopefully it's not the end of you, because we might need you for <laughs> questions later. Um, well our next uh, presenter is Kevin Fitzpatrick. Now, once again, um, lovely bloke. I've had the pleasure of dealing with uh, Kevin on many occasions, uh, as part of my former employ and my later employ uh, in different capacities. Um, Kevin has obviously um, joined Maddox as a consultant, uh, as has Stephen, I should have mentioned previously. But prior to that, um, Kevin, uh, was the Chief Tax Counsel. He acted as Second Commissioner for quite a while uh, in different capacities um, within the tax office. Uh, Kevin's um, uh, bio uh, is, is actually quite short. There's a lot of other things that he could have put in there as well. Uh, he obviously um, won the Public Service Medal, which um, is something that if you've been in the public service, it's a, it's a, it's a very good thing to have. Uh, if you haven't been in the public service, uh, then you probably don't know much about it. But um, without further ado, I'll introduce Kevin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I apologise in advance for my husky voice, trying to get over the ribbons for a cold. I thought I'd come to Sydney and might do the world of good for me, but. Not so far, but anyhow, um, I just wanted to, uh, I must remember to turn this over, I? I must, um, I must want, to, I want to talk about, from an ATO perspective, why tax risk management is um, important. And Stephen mentioned about the relationship you want with the ATO. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how the sort of tax risk management framework you have will affect that relationship. Um, I also want to finish by talking a little bit about how to improve your experience in risk reviews and audits based on my thoughts from being in the ATO for a number of years and to some extent well, recently in the last couple of years since I retired from the ATO in my um, work with Maddox particularly in helping taxpayers um, manage and deal with the ATO. So. Most of you, if not all of you, would be familiar with um, the risk differentiation framework which the ATO has in place, particularly for large and medium corporates, particularly the large end, certainly. Um, this has evolved um, somewhat over the years and it is still evolving. Um, and what really has evolved, I, I think it's fair to say, is the transparency of the ATO's uh, assessment of risk based on the likelihood and consequences of non-compliance. Now I should say at the outset, I've used the term non-compliance on this slide and a few others. Some might uh, question that, um, but really what it means is that if the ATO disagrees with a taxpayer position, that's what I mean by non-compliance. Now the ATO may be wrong or may be right about that, to take it in that context, non-compliance means the ATO disagreeing with the taxpayer position. So it, it makes an assessment based on the likelihood of that happening and the consequences of it happening. And uh, as you would be aware, I think the consequences mean revenue, etc. And taxpayers are in the quadrants of key and high risk taxpayers. High risk being a greater likelihood of not sharing the ATO's position on a particular issue. The ATO is certainly seeking a more open relationship with taxpayers. There's no question about that. Now, why is it doing that? Um, well, I think at the end of the day, it's trying to improve voluntary <coughs> compliance. It'd be great 
from an ATO perspective, I think all of our perspectives, if the great majority of taxpayers uh, do voluntary comply and there's no real issues. Now, I think that probably is right for most taxpayers, um, but there are some, of course, where there are differences of view. But the ATO is seeking to have a better relationship and a more open and transparent relationship with a, with a view in mind to continue to improve voluntary compliance. Now, I, I think there are benefits and opportunities out of this more open, transparent sharing of the ATO's perception of risks with taxpayers. Uh, it certainly gives you, I think, an increased certainty of what the ATO's concerns are, if they have any concerns. Um, it's the early identification of those risks and concerns which can then be addressed. And we'll talk a little bit about ways of doing that. Um, and of course, it's an opportunity for a taxpayer to influence the ATO's views and perceptions. If you're more aware of what the ATO's thinking is, what its concerns are, what it sees as risks and why they are risks, you have an opportunity to influence that. And I think that's something which is good for taxpayers and good for the system as a whole. What factors determine the ATO's risk categorisation? Well, there's a lot of information out there in the ATO's large business and tax compliance publication, which is generally updated each year. A lot of information around risk assessments and how the ATO goes about it and what influences it. Uh, there's also information in its, what used to be called the Compliance Program, now published in a publication called Compliance in Focus, which I think certainly is an annual publication about what the ATO sees as risks or areas of the law it's going to focus on in the next 12 months. So I do encourage you, if you don't already do this, to, to look at those publications and it does give a lot of information there about the ATO, how the ATO sees this and why it, how it goes about categorising risk. Um, it is an ATO perception of the consequences of non-compliance, as I said before, and the consequences are based on the size and the taxes paid relative influence. So most of the large public companies, for example, are either they're high consequence for those reasons, and they are either in the category of a key taxpayer, or if the likelihood of the ATO of not complying with the ATO's view is such, it'll be a high risk category. Um, as a result of those categorisations, the ATO will certainly take a close look at both key and high risk taxpayers. High risk, obviously, take a closer look than key taxpayers. And I think it's fair to say most of the large public companies, for example, are key taxpayers in that category of risk. Um, too quick. Now, the perception of likelihood of non-compliance there are a range of factors, and this is probably the more relevant and important to talk about. How the ATA perceives a particular taxpayer, whether the likelihood of its taking a view of a law which it disagrees with. There are a range of factors set out in the publications I talked the publication I talked about about the large business and tax compliance. I've just referred to three there which I think are important. Um, but I should say that none of them are going to determine one way or the other, but taken together, you need to weigh these up. The level of transparency in informing the ATO about significant transactions or potentially contentious issues. Um, obviously, the more open the relationship is, the more likely a taxpayer is of um, informing the ATO about something which has high consequence, significant transaction, uh, or something contentious. Um, the compliance history, and what does that mean? Well, um, it's past compliance behaviour in simple terms. 
how has the taxpayer complied in the past? Has it taken aggressive positions? Um, has it taken views which consistently the tax office doesn't agree with? Or is it different to that? Or if it has taken aggressive positions in the past, is there evidence that it's changed? And often there is evidence of that. Just because a taxpayer may have been aggressively planning in the past doesn't mean it will continue to do so and the ATO will take a dim view of that. If, if changes take place and the ATO sees that, uh, it'll be a factor obviously going in favour of the taxpayer about their categorisation of risk. And the third one I've included there is the quality of the tax risk management and governance. Very important. This is what Stephen essentially has been talking about. What does that mean from a corporate's point of view? The quality of that tax risk management and governance framework is a very important factor in the ATO's mind about the categorisation of risk. I think it's fair to say that if the ATO is not satisfied with the taxpayer having an appropriate risk governance framework in place, um, it's likely to be categorising the taxpayer if it's a large taxpayer in the high risk category rather than a key taxpayer. And the implications which flow from that greater monitoring and watching um, if you're not in the high consequence category, you're in the medium and low risk, you're obviously going to move um, to medium risk if you haven't got an appropriate tax risk governance framework in place. Very important, and the ATO, for a number of years now, and I think it goes back to 2004 I mentioned earlier, taking a very keen interest in this, and this is essentially what we're here for, to talk about what does it all mean. And why is it important? But there are other factors which you can read in the publication uh, which are relevant. Um, sometimes there are uh, what's called risk filters. You know, the compliance program annually sets out the areas of risk the ATO will be looking at. That will be, if that's relevant to a particular corporate group, that will be taken into account. Um, can, can I ask you a question about the ATO view of tax risk management? framework. Yep. Um, how do I know that I've got one that will pass muster with the ATO? Um, by talking to the ATO and discussing it, seeing what questions the ATO has about it. There are, I'm just going to go on Peter, there are various checklists which the ATO talks about in this publication which gives you an indication I think of the sort of things it expects to see. And I'm, I'm happy to go through that. Um, because I think, again, there in the publication I talked about, large business and tax compliance, and it does give an indication of um, what that means. Before I do go through that, I just want to show up there some statements from the ATO I've taken out of their publications, which you can read um, what its expectations are of a robust framework. Yep. Uh, well, perhaps Stephen might be able to answer that question better than me. Um, there's, there's an expectation that the ATO will review it. Certainly for those who are in an annual compliance arrangement, Stephen, uh, that would be the case, wouldn't it? It's yeah, I think it's beyond that. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I, we had ours reviewed yeah. uh, by the ATO. In fact, they didn't just start at the tax risk management framework. They looked at, they started at the top, at the governance framework for the whole organisation and, and how various um, risks, be they tax risks, credit risks, operating risks, were, were managed up through that framework. And then they started to concentrate on the, on the tax part of it only. So that we got the going over, um, but I, it, it wasn't because we were in an ACA or not in an ACO. Oh. I think that's now part and parcel of, of the ATO's um, armoury, particularly with a Category 2 taxpayer. Which is yeah. the key taxpayer and certainly yeah. a high risk taxpayer in the same mm. vein. Certainly the ATO, as I said, 
wants to be satisfied there's appropriate or robust, but want want a better term, framework in place. So how does it become satisfied? And I, I would imagine seeing what's there, what's in place, talking to you about it, mm. looking about what's being presented to the board and how is that presented. Is the board continuing to be satisfied that risks are being not only identified but also managed? How does it become satisfied of that? So just a few quotes there from the ATO. Um, Stephen mentioned a couple of times in his presentation about what is your de desired relationship with the Revenue Authority, in this case here in the ATO. Um, and that's something which we talked about a little while ago about what does it mean. Um, that last quote there, better relationships with the, with the, eight, with the large business lead to fewer awarded interventions and improves certainty for both of us. Probably goes without saying. If you have an open and transparent and a good relationship, uh, you are going to get less intervention from the ATO. Here's Carmen. <coughs> Thank you. What we've been seeing in, in the slides and, and the message that's coming across very strongly is that um, we're seeing, uh, hearing a lot about what the ATO's expectations are in order for this um, tax risk governance piece to work as part of improving the relationship with the ATO and also aiding that filtering process where the ATO can have confidence that it then doesn't apply its audit products, etc. However, um, I think it's very important to look at the other side of that relationship and the expectations um, of the, the taxpayer in terms of the openness and transparency of the ATO in, in those dealings with, with the taxpayer. Yep. And certainly um, in our experience, over the last 12 months, and particularly since Chris Jordan has been the Commissioner, there's been a lot of work done within the ATO to um, improve that transparency so that that engagement can be, um, um, you know, achieve the sorts of objectives that, that we're talking about. What are your observations about that? And, and oh, I think over the last yeah, it's a good question. I, certainly, the ATO can continue to improve its ability to be open and transparent. Uh, I said at the outset, this whole concept of openness and transparency and sharing the ATO's risks is still evolving, and it does. It is still evolving. It's interesting, uh, um, the Inspector General, Andrew might want to comment about this, but the Inspector General of Tax did a review around the ATO risk assessment processes and tools, etc. I think it was last year, Andrew, and the report was released in February this year. Now, in I think chapter three of that report, which is a very comprehensive report, it focuses on the risk differentiation framework used for large business in particular, and I think broadly, same principles apply, and will we'll continue, will we'll apply in the future to small, mediums, and, and private groups as well as public groups. There's a lot of information in that report explaining what this is about and the issues or concerns taxpayers and advisors have. And it makes a number of recommendations which the ATO, I think, just about assent or agreed with just about every one of them, about improving the whole process and including the point Carmen has made. How the ATO can become better at communicating what it really is about and what its concerns are and uh, why it's got these concerns. And I think there's a fair bit there, Andrew, if, correct me if I'm wrong in any respect, but... I know there is. Um, for those of you who are familiar, the first report where we looked at this was the um, Large Business and International Review that we did um, in 2009-10. Uh, that's when people first got their letters about notification in relation to their different risk categories, um, the first one around the block. There's, there was pretty much universal uh, agreement that that was not done particularly well. Uh, so there were changes made to the process to try and make sure that uh, people did get their letters rather than getting phone calls. There was, there was a range of different things. The letters were not necessarily 
uh, comprehensive or address the particular issues um, in an objective sort of format that a lot of people were sort of asking for. Um, that, that process was very helpful to get some insight around what the tax office were trying to achieve by, by categorising or, and notifying people of um, their view of whether or not you're risky or not risky. So, suffice to say, I think, um, some of you may be in the audience, a lot of people were quite shocked by what, by, by what they got. Uh, but I think Kevin's point is, do you better off for knowing rather than not knowing? And um, that's, that's something that some people have, have really sort of come to terms with around uh, what the internal perception may or may not have been about your organisation before it was publicised. The, the universal thing that I've got back from people about this whole palaver, as someone said to me, um, what's the benefit? Like, what, what do I get out of it as a taxpayer? It's all very well for the tax office to tell me about what they want, but what do I get? And, and again, some of the discussion tends to go round and round and round about what the tax office wants, but sometimes I think the more important question is to ask, what do you want? What does your CFO want? What does your CEO want? And what does the board want, ultimately, as Stephen's been talking through? If there isn't a benefit that you're seeing out of it, then you need to kind of wrestle with that a bit more to understand what it is that you're looking to get from this particular outcome. And I think it goes directly to what Carmen's saying. That, that's what, what I kind of got as a big sense. Sometimes it's unspoken in groups that that's really your big concern. I do all this work, I go to all this trouble to just get more trouble. Is, is, is what a lot of people were saying to us. Now, I agree with Carmen, there's been a change in the management structure. Um, we still get you know, some sort of rumblings around that, it, that the, the nature of the change is not completely filtering through around what's going on. That's anecdotal, I have no evidence around that. That's not within our reports as a, as a more recent paradigm, but certainly going back through that particular report, that's why we went to so much trouble to outline a lot of detail around what is going on within the tax office, around how you're being categorised, because it's such a critical issue when you're walking out to board or to a CEO or CFO, if you don't know exactly what it is that, that's being assessed against you. I, th I think, it's, I said at the outset, this is evolving and will continue to evolve. I think there are plenty of benefits for taxpayers out of this more open sharing of the ATO's perception of its concerns, its risks, and the reasons for that. Of course the KHA can get better at it, and you should ensure that it continues to get better at it through dialogue, seeking explanations. And I think, without going on about that, um, it, I, I would imagine that it will continue to get better. The tax, the tax office does, and has been for a number of years, wants to engage. The system will be better off. Taxpayers will be better off, as well as the tax office, in a more open and transparent relationship. Sorry, the mic yeah. is. Yeah. Sorry, Ron, if you, Sorry, if you, if you want to just grab, put your hand up, we'll get the mic to you as soon as we can. Sorry, in terms of um, a lot of these expectations about tax risk frameworks, even tax risk registers, um, they have to have a purpose and, you know, if that per one of those purposes is to convey some of those risks to the ATO or disclose some of those risks to the ATO, then um, the, the company or taxpayer has to be confident that they can trust in that relationship uh, with the ATO that they will be dealt with um, in a way that... Um, you know, satisfies the objectives or has mutual benefit yeah. to the ATO and, and the taxpayer. I think that's key. I agree with that. Kevin? Uh, Kevin, can you go back to your last slide? Oh, I will never finish. I was trying to go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Slow no, it down. Um, is, that with, is that it? This, yes. You can see this, Kevin's left the tax office. He's going ahead. <laughs> this first quote up here says, managing your tax risk well is core to good corporate governance. And then it adds, particularly if you are operating in international markets. And I'm wondering if that later reference means transfer pricing, BEPS, means you have to do a better job if you're operating in international markets. I just, I just sort of thought they could have put a full stop after managing your tax risk well is good 
he's called a good corporate governance. I'm not well, they, they could have, Chris. Um, I suppose why do they put particularly in the international markets? Well, at the large end of town, it's pretty common anyhow. There are clear risks, which we all know about, around base erosion and profit shifting, as people see it. And this is not just peculiar to Australia, this tax risk governance. The OECD have endorsed tax risk governance management governance framework, and it's consistent with that. I'll move on. Um, Peter asked a question about what does it mean, what does the ATO expect? And I mentioned the ATO sees it on two levels, I think, a robust framework. How you manage risk on a, at a strategic level and secondly at an operational level, which essentially is about the controls you have in place. And I won't go through these in any detail because essentially they're consistent with what Stephen has been talking about. There's nothing inconsistent in my view about what the ATO was saying and what Stephen was saying before about what's expected of a robust tax risk management framework. So I put some strategic checklists there and some operational ones. And there are more checklist indicators in the publication I mentioned earlier. Um, I just want to touch briefly on uh, how you might manage tax risk through a transparent relationship. And we've already spoken about annual compliance arrangements and Stephen talked about it in the context of ANZ. From a tax office point of view, it's really about greater certainty, reduced costs, taxpayer and tax office enhanced relationships. Um, and I think it encourages those in the key tax bag risk category, that risk category to think about entering into ACAs. I think, as Stephen touched on, there are benefits both the taxpayer and the tax office. The advanced pricing agreements or arrangements are essentially to deal with international dealings in a similar way. Um, I mentioned reportable tax positions there, um, which is now, as you know, uh, a requirement for certain taxpayers to report what essentially are the most contestable material tax positions. Um, what does it do? Well, it helps the ATO to better identify and understand the risks and what a taxpayer's risk category ought to be. Um, I'm sure it's still going through um, some teething issues in a sense of how you properly complete that schedule and what should be on it or included in it and what should not be. But it's from an ATO point of view, it's trying to find out and better understand what are the key tax issues and risks out there for a taxpayer so it can focus its attention more readily on those rather than be hunting around and fishing around to see what they are. That's essentially what it's about, as I see it. Um, the pre-lodgement compliance review I've touched on is um, essentially a risk review being brought forward to an earlier point of time. Um, that will continue to evolve and the people in the ATO will get better at it, I suspect. And it involves a dialogue between the tax office and taxpayer about what are the risks occurring in, in a sense, real time. Um, it gives you an opportunity to um, understand at an earlier point of time what the ATO's concerns might be, what its perception of your risks might be. Um, and it gives you an opportunity, therefore, to address those in a dialogue sense at an earlier point of time and, if it's done effectively, to get earlier closure than might have been traditionally the case over, over the years. I'm being wound up by a uh, facilitator next to me. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes um, on what I've thought, called improving your taxpayer experience for the ATO. Um, Stephen mentioned you should be ready to preempt what the ATO might be interested in and looking at. Um, in my terms, the risk areas talked about in the compliance and focus publication will give you an indication of where the ATO is wanting to pay attention. 
obviously international profit shifting is an issue at the moment, and also new areas of the law where the ATO wants to see whether taxpayers are properly complying. You can just imagine some complex new areas of law like TOFA in recent times. How are taxpayers complying? Tax, tax, tax office needs to test that. So if you want to, for each issue or risk um, which the tax office may be likely to look at in your situation, how should you prepare? Now, Peter will no doubt talk a little bit about this in a few minutes, and, and Tony as well. Um, but in my experience, what I would be suggesting to people and recommending, you should focus on these sort of issues. In preparation for a likely review or audit, try to ensure, ensure there's a shared understanding of the material facts. A lot of the problem we have, the problems we've had with ATO audits and risk reviews over the years has been it takes so long to get an understanding, a shared understanding of the facts. If I was preparing for a risk review, this is what I'd be doing. I'd be trying to get a statement of material facts and make sure the ATO has a shared understanding of those. I'd be trying to get an explanation in a commercial sense of why things happen relevant to the relevant risk or issue you're dealing with. Um, what is the evidence supporting the facts, the key facts and the explanation for why it happened? What is the accounting treatment? And what is the tax treatment and reasons why the tax and accounting treatments are different? Sometimes that's very important for the ATO to understand. Not sometimes, it is always important. And sometimes the ATO people don't understand it. If you want to prepare properly, in my view, this is the sort of thing you should be doing. Why does a tax outcome or the treatment differ from the accounting? And obviously, there are often many, and I shouldn't say many, there are obviously good reasons why that happens. But to articulate those reasons for the ATO, I think it would be helpful. And obviously, supporting your tax treatment. What supports your tax treatment? <coughs> Excuse me. And I've suggested some things there. If you follow those, that sort of path, in my view, in my, based on my experience in the ATO and more recently my consulting work, that'll help you and help the ATO get to understand what's happened and why it's happened. And if there are any areas of disagreement, ref refine those issues of dispute. And firms like Maddox and CTH with its technology tools can help you and getting on the front foot, because I think that's getting on the front foot. And I think that's a good way of improving your experience in dealing with the ATO and managing your tax risk. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, for those of you who've been on the other side of Kevin when he was at the tax office, I had a lot of trouble getting to wind up back then, so <laughs> nothing's changed. Um, with respect to our next speaker, uh, Peter Poulos, um, he is a real gentleman and someone I've had the pleasure of dealing with over a number of years as well. Um, Peter's, uh, Peter's bio is, um, is, is relatively short, and again, I think he's um, probably uh, not done himself credit in many respects. There's a lot more that he could have put down about himself. But he's obviously one of the senior partners at, um, at Maddox and has uh, a lot of history in both um, litigation and uh, alternative forms of dispute resolution. I think Peter's pretty well placed to sort of um, talk to us about some of the things that happen in that middle ground. <coughs> hey, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew has never had any trouble winding me up. Thank you. Um, <coughs> let me just uh, deal with going in the wrong direction. Um, before I uh, talk about the slide, just uh, want to stand back and um, think about the um, perspective that we're dealing with here. Uh, 
We've heard a lot about the benefits for um, taxpayers of actually having a, an appropriate tax governance structure, and that includes in the interface with the tax office. The tax office is expecting you to be thinking about this. Uh, I think the key to that structure and the key to uh, understanding why it's of benefit to you is also to understand how you can use it in your judgments about um, the transactions you enter into, about the interactions you have with the tax office. Uh, because a, a lot of what comes out of such a, a, a structure is to benefit you in being able to marshal things like um, Kevin spoke about in the last slide, uh, the evidence that you're going to deal with, the strategy that you're going to come forward with, issues of what degree of transparency am I going to have with the tax office in relation to this, uh, what treatment do I need to apply to the particular transaction, am I satisfied that I don't really have to go and talk to the tax office about it, I've got sufficiently robust advice that tells me that I'll, I'll wait, I'm comfortable with my treatment of it and I don't necessarily need to go and engage. Now, um, these are matters of judgment that uh, need to be uh, woven into what is uh, otherwise a process, which is a governance process that sets the framework for this decision making. So I think it's very important for people to sit back and think about practically how we then uh, create the circumstances that enable us to make informed decisions when we're looking at managing of tax risks. Uh, now, our perspective is uh, as um, solicitors who uh, can be brought in and are brought in at any particular point in what we call um, a tax continuum. So starting at the point of the transaction and saying, OK, what is it in respect of this transaction that might otherwise create a tax risk? What needs to be documented? What needs to be captured? What do we need to think about in the context of the ATO um, view of the transaction and the materiality of that risk and the way in which we will then be communicating with the tax office, whether it's in respect of the transaction or in respect of an inquiry in relation to the transaction. So it's putting yourself in the position to be able to do those things. Um, we have any number of uh, what we describe as if only moments when we get matters where we say if only we had done this or if only we had done that or if only we'd captured this or captured that. Um, we had a, a circumstance where we were dealing with the transfer pricing matter. We were going back a number of years. We're trying to find documents. We're trying to find people. Uh, and I asked um, a senior person uh, where their filing cabinets were, where the filing system was, and he pointed to the bin in the corner and said, that's it. So that's the sort of issue that we confront on a daily basis as litigators at the very pointy end of these things. So you need to be thinking about the risks that are being created in your business uh, as a result of uh, tax issues that can arise and that you can anticipate. Uh, Kevin's spoken about looking at what the ATO is doing in terms of compliance. Well, you understand the Commissioner is looking at international transactions or looking at um, CGT issues or something of that nature. And in your position, you're uniquely placed to look at those issues and say, this could be an issue in the future, it, it, it is material, and therefore, what sort of treatment do I need to apply to this? You're doing what the ATO does when it looks at the, the calculation of risk and the calculation of materiality and it's saying do I need to look at this from a compliance perspective and one of the things you should be doing is putting the ATO hat on and saying I've had some advice from person X or person Y or persons X and Y um, but what will the ATO think of this in the context of the particular transaction and its materiality and the tax risks that it throws up. Those are the sorts of things I think you should be building into your tax risk framework and trying to avoid some of those if only moments that occur down the track. Um, we uh, act both for taxpayers and the tax office and we have these if only moments on both sides of that transaction. There are always going to be issues where you say, well, why didn't the ATO look at this or look at that or deal with this? Why didn't the ATO accept this argument or this evidence? Um, all of those things need to be put into the mix when you're making a judgment calls as you're actually implementing your tax risk framework and you're thinking about what the consequences might be in the future. Now, for me, tax risks, um, particularly in the context of uh, dealing with the tax office, uh, are not just about the 
the dollars that might be involved in the transaction. That also include things like, well, um, do I really want to go to court on this? Is there a reputational issue for me in the context of this? Uh, there's a litigation cost as well as a tax cost, and there's a potentially a relationship cost. All of those things need to go into your thinking as you're thinking about the strategy that you're going to be employing in attempting to manage something that might become a problem, or that is a problem in the particular circumstances. So those are matters which, as Stephen has alluded to, fit into your risk appetite. Well, what is my risk appetite? The number of times clients have come and said, I don't want to litigate this, and I say to them, so what bargaining position then do you have with the tax office if you're not actually prepared to defend your position, if you're not prepared to put the war paint on and show the commissioner you're prepared to defend it? So you need to understand there are consequences for the particular postures that you take in relation to um, these potential disputes with the commissioner. Uh, you also need to understand that uh, a lack of an ability to respond uh, adequately uh, and in a timely way to the commissioner also creates its own risk. Uh, why can't you give me the information I've asked for? Uh, why do you need so much time for that? I would have expected you to have this stuff at your fingertips. What does that tell the Commissioner about your readiness uh, and your ability to actually manage this? And if you're in a position where you can manage the communication with the Commissioner, the dialogue, then you are in a far better position to influence the outcome. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the other issues in the context of thinking about this is also to look at the changing landscape as we're looking at uh, where the new Commissioner is taking the new tax office. Now, we're still going to have compliance issues, we're still going to have compliance reviews. All of those things exist, but they exist in a circumstance where things like an alternative dispute resolution uh, are at the forefront of the thinking in terms of how we can manage these disputes, where the Commissioner says, I want to have dialogue. And that means that you, as a taxpayer, need to be ready to have that dialogue you need to be saying, OK, what is my strategy in terms of what I will say to the Commissioner about this, what I will disclose in terms of documents? Is my strategy to be full and transparent <coughs> in relation to this, or do I want to be in a position where I'm managing it in a different way because uh, I have a different strategy? And that may well be driven by a consideration of the, the material that you have available to you, the risks that you see, uh, and also an assessment of whether or not this is a case that the Commissioner may decide he wants to take on for a compliance purpose or for the purposes of the clarification of law. So where are you in, in the spectrum of potential disputes with the Commissioner? And all of this needs to be built into the way in which you would otherwise respond when you're thinking about, uh, here's something that's in my, in my framework, uh, I need to get some advice about this. I need to think about a strategy. What is my strategy going to be? Now, the other thing is that there is um, what I would describe as a need for informed decision making in this process. That is, you need to understand, um, and again, going back to Kevin's last slide, well, what evidence do you have? What are your arguments? Uh, is this a novel area of law and is that going to create an issue in terms of uh, a debate with the Commissioner about it? Uh, are we going to have some issues in relation to different interpretations of the law and how are we going to manage that and what's the best way of dealing with that process? You need to be putting yourself in the position where you can say, I have at my fingertips the available evidence, uh, I've thought about the arguments, uh, I have thought about my communication dialogue strategy with the Commissioner, uh, and I thought about the strategy for resolving the dispute. And that may well be in the context of, let's find an ADR process, it might be in the context of saying, well, perhaps I need to push this into uh, the new era of internal review. Um, what does that mean for me? Um, should I go and get a ruling? All sorts of other issues and strategies will need to be thought about in the context of managing these issues. Um, I think it's important to understand those those issues so that you can, uh, if you are confronting these issues and you're thinking about this in the context of tax risk, you can say, uh, if we uh, are challenged in relation to something, here's the documentation that we've got available. Here's the explanation we've got available. That includes the commercial rationale for it, if that's a relevant matter in the particular dispute. Uh, and here's the way in which we will approach the Commissioner and deal with it. 
Um, in some cases, what we have done is said to the Commissioner, let us do the audit for you. This is a complicated matter. And it's going to take a long time if you try to work your way through a series of questions and answers. We can take control of the process. Here's the information you require. Here's why we say our position is robust. Come and talk to us. And uh, taking control of that process can sometimes cut through a lot of the issues. And it, it takes on the Commissioner in the sense of the Commissioner saying, I want to have dialogue. So take the opportunity. Take the opportunity to have that dialogue. Insist upon it. And in that way, you can narrow issues, uh, particularly in relation to evidence. You can understand how the Commissioner is viewing you as a taxpayer and your material, um, whether there are any relationship issues that are getting in the way of a proper dialogue, and also that you're talking to the right people in the tax office about the particular issue, so that the relevant people are at the table so you can have this to and fro that will help you better understand and manage the process. Now, part of the risk strategy needs to be that you are in a position to actually uh, identify material tax issues, that you're sufficiently plugged into what's happening in the organisation to ensure that you're getting information about uh, a material uh, transaction uh, or, or uh, other dealing which could, could cause a tax risk, uh, and that you're also in the position where uh, you can identify and get access to the requisite information, evidence, people, whatever may be necessary for the purposes of gathering together the, the requisite evidence to deal with the transaction or dealing that you, you're, you then need to be expressing a tax opinion on. So it is key in that particular circumstance to, to actually be in a position to be able to say to the business or the business operations areas, this is the information that I require. This is what we need to capture. Um, the number of times people have left organisations in circumstances where they don't particularly want to assist um, is uh, countless for me in the context of then being able to say, OK, so how do we now deal with um, the fact that a, a key witness is no longer going to be available to us? Uh, could we have done something to actually capture what that person could otherwise have said to us about this transaction uh, at some other point in time? And should that be something we're building into our tax risk frameworks when we're thinking about material risk and saying, what process needs to hang off this to make sure that we then manage that risk? Because the risk is documents disappear, people disappear. Um, and that's why I say that what you should be doing is capturing the important contemporaneous documents thinking about what those documents are and making sure that you have put in place a process that enables you to actually capture and retain it. Uh, and I should also say, reproduce it if required. Um, in one of the later slides, I talk about a circumstance we had where, again, in a transfer pricing matter, we were asking for um, something that you thought should be available, which is, um, what price did you acquire product for? But we we're going back a number of years and the information was on a, a server, um, and the server had broken down. And it would have cost um, a significant sum of money to repair the server to get the information. The business had other, um, other um, perspectives, and they didn't want to spend the money, and they had other things they wanted to do. So it was enormously frustrating to get to a position where we could actually extract the information which was really quite central to our ability to respond properly and adequately to the tax office. So you need to be thinking about how I manage those, uh, those sorts of issues and if you do that up front then you are in a far better position then to respond. And again, uh, in my experience, if you're in a position where you can confidently deal with those things early on, you are going to be putting yourself in a far better position in your dialogue with the Commissioner. Peter, sorry to interrupt. Is, is, is that to say that people should be tax planning? Because I, I hear a lot about tax risk management, but I don't hear the tax planning words used very much anymore. Is, is that right? Um, uh, when you're um, entering into a transaction, you always think about the tax consequences of it. Mm -hmm. So is that tax planning? Yeah, I understand tax planning is yes. okay, though. No one's told me that that's illegal, but I'm just, just trying to test it. At what point are, are, are people responsible to do that? Is that something that shareholders expect? I mean, is that something that corporate should be considering? Uh, I, I think in the context of this, um, a, 
uh, you would expect a robust tax risk framework would be thinking about issues like, um, in the context of this particular transaction, um, what's the most economic way of dealing with it? And tax may be a consideration in there. And, and it, it, people shouldn't be afraid of the fact that tax is a consideration, it generally is. The High Court has told us in Spotless that it's always going to be something because it's a feature of the law that you deal with. So, um, sorry, you were going to... And I was just going to ask whether the audience has any sense of feeling or they've got questions around that particular issue. It seems to me what they're saying about being organised up front and doing what you need to do to satisfy the nature of evidence and questions like that, they're very important questions. To try and look at that as an, as an afterthought or a curative um, seems to be a very uh, difficult way to go about doing things. Well, I'm not sure if anybody in the audience has any perspective on that. We, we don't do any tax planning here. So we don't do an aggressive tax plan. <laughs> we don't do aggressive tax planning. Well, it, you know, the word aggressive, the, it, it depends on perspective, and that's what we're dealing with here. And so it's very much a matter of saying, well, I don't think it is, or my advisor doesn't think it is, and, and, but when I look at this and I stand back and I take a robust view of it, um, the Commissioner may. And so what I then have to deal with is, well, uh, okay, I'm happy to go ahead in my tax risk framework. Um, I've ticked all the boxes. But one of the boxes I've ticked is, will the commissioner look at this and what will he think if he does? And when I've ticked that box, don't I then have to do something else in the context yeah. of my tax risk framework? So, so that's the issue really. I mean, are you in a position where you've captured that key question, and then are you in a position to say, I now have a process that I can apply to make sure that that's robustly dealt with, and that if I get a question from the board, I'll say, we looked at it, and this is the view we took. Uh, the commissioner, being the unreasonable person he is, took a different view. But other than that, we, we think we're in a position to manage it, and we shall deal with that um, in the context of the, uh, uh, of the debate we'll then have with the commissioner. Sorry, Carmen, you heard a Just on that, um, that ticking the box, uh, we're, we're often um, confronted in audit situations where we're acting for the, the taxpayer, um, where we are advised, look, there's, ab there's absolutely not going to be any problem, we don't anticipate any issues with the ATO uh, because we've had advice at the time. Uh, we see that all the time, but of course the ATO may take a different view. And it's also about anticipating that, that different view and that different perspective and approaching it with objectivity. Um, could you agree with that, please? Uh, yes. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I was going to say I take that as a comment, but, <laughs> but somebody else does that. Um, there, there is always that issue about, and that's why I use the word robust, that, that you really uh, need to be thinking about um, the independence and the objectivity of the advice that you've got. Because that's part also of uh, your ability to say to the Commissioner, our framework is robust. Um, this is not just convenient advice that we've gotten from somebody, it's something that actually um, has, where, where somebody has looked at it from an independent point of view uh, and has provided that advice to us. That could be in the context of legal advice, it could be evaluation, it could be transfer pricing documentation, it could be anything in the, in the context of the issues that you have to deal with. So it is really important to be able to uh, convey, um, to firstly, I think, from, from the perspective of a taxpayer, to be able to say, I've got robust independent advice. Uh, I'm comfortable with it. I can defend my position. So that's, and I can then go to the board and say, this is what we've done. Um, this is not just a convenient advice for the purposes of me getting a bonus because I've made a tax saving. It is, um, in the context in which we're dealing with it, uh, independent and verified. So I think people need to be thinking about the, the way in which they think about how they mitigate risk, um, but also to be sh ensure that they are, they are being objective about the material risks that are actually uh, they're confronting in the particular transaction. Um, the other aspect of this is to think about the strategy that you might otherwise go forward with. Do you want to go to the Commission in relation to it? Is transparency actually what you require in a particular circumstance? Aren't you, are you better off in some circumstances saying, well, I can take a reasonably argued position here. Um, I don't necessarily want to advance a particular matter. Uh, I'm comfortable that our advice is sufficiently robust and I'll wait 
until the Commissioner comes to me. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate way to deal with this. Um, I'd be interested in Kevin's comment about whether if I said that to the tax office and he, when he asked me why didn't you come to me, um, I would have a problem. Well, it depends. Um, Lawyers say that, Kevin. Yes, that's right. Um, well, no, the Commissioner doesn't expect everybody to come on every issue to get a ruling or raise it. I suppose it's a question of, uh, well, how important is it to come on a particular transaction and how contentious is it? The Commissioner will weigh that up amongst other risk factors in determining how he sees the, the taxpayer being open or not. Um, nowadays, of course, the reportable tax position for some taxpayers require you to to come forward with certain positions in any event. And as I indicated earlier, that's helping the Commissioner understand what are the key risks or items of contention, issues of contention. I think the other thing that keys in is the fact that um, these things um, will be sped up. Um, that's my impression of it. Uh, the Commissioner has um, undertaken a process of clearing the decks. Um, audits that run for five years should no longer e exist. It's now going to be 18 months to, to two years. So, and you're going to have the, you have the pre-compliance um, lodgement pre process. So, yeah. pre thank you. Um, yeah, it may well be pre-compliance as well. Um, you're dealing with this in the circumstance in which uh, you are going to be dealing with things more contemporaneously. And so if you think about that in the context of uh, what you've then got to manage in, in relation to transactions that are being entered into, you should be anticipating uh, a query in relation to this and that uh, I'm going to need to be in a position relatively soon to be able to deal with the tax office in, a, in an appropriate way in relation to this, the, the way in which I provide information, the way in which I perhaps put in a submission. So those things are necessary for you to think about in the context of why am I doing this uh, and it's essentially to assist you, to assist yourself in dealing with the tax office and to make it clear to the tax office that you are able to respond effectively and in a timely manner. And you also need to think about that in the context of, particularly in the large market, but also down now to 250 million in the small market, um, the possibility of internal review. You want to be in a position where you've presented your case as well as you can, uh, bearing in mind that in the internal review process at the moment at least, you can't introduce new material, so you want to make sure that you have put forward your best possible case for the purposes of persuading someone in that process that they should leave you alone. Um, and taxpayers have been quite successful in that process. Uh, nearly 50% of the internal reviews that have been conducted have been in favour of the taxpayer. So it's quite an opportunity for you and one that you should be looking at in the context of managing disputes or managing risk as you're going forward. One caveat to that is the Commissioner will get better at the internal review, review process. He will learn his lessons from it. So you need to also be ahead of the game in relation to those sorts of issues. Um, let me just, I've gone the wrong way again. It's, uh, it's a trouble with acting both for and against the tax office. I'm not sure where I am. Um, one of the issues is, uh, in, in the context of uh, systems, um, you also just need to be testing the robustness of the systems you've got. So a particular case study here that we had was, we had um, a GST taxpayer, um, a number of transactions, uh, so the materiality is in the build-up of the number of transactions over time. Uh, they had a, an electronic invoicing system, but unfortunately the electronic invoicing system failed to capture a couple of key matters necessary for a tax invoice. So tax office came, had a look at it and said, well, you're not compliant. And what that meant was all of your input tax credits for the last four years are now going to be denied to you uh, and there's going to be a penalty. And so there was this enormous risk that had been built up because of what you would think would be a very simple check that should have been done about compliance. Now, that was able to be dealt with by um, showing the Commission that the system was robust and that there was no revenue leakage that came through it and to ask him to exercise his discretion. And he did, um, which is why you need to be 
um, how should I describe it, keep your relationship with the tax office on a very even keel because every now and again you'll want him to do something for you uh, as opposed to him doing things to you. So you need to, you need to be thinking about how you manage those, um, those sorts of issues in the context of this. Um, I've mentioned to you digital records, um, making sure that you've got access to material because in the main, in your function, you don't have access to records um, that are in other areas. Uh, and they don't think about what tax issues might otherwise arise, so you need to be communicating to them, these are the things I need to be able to access. Where will I access them? Uh, and who can assist me in that process? Um, in a lot of instances, uh, advice, um, consideration of issues, transactions, operates on sometimes on assumptions and it's, it's really important to make sure you verify those assumptions. I'll, I'll give you a somewhat absurd example but uh, we were dealing with a dispute um, and the dispute was about whether a particular taxpayer was on, in the business of financing and um, the taxpayer said we have this advice from a QC, very, very senior QC, he acts for the Commissioner all the time so you can be satisfied that um, we've been through this and uh, he's ticked off the, um, the, the, that question. And the Commissioner asked for the advice and was given it. And the first line of the advice was, I've been asked to assume that Company X is in the business of X. And so it was a completely useless piece of advice because in fact the, the, the issue had not been addressed by the taxpayer. Uh, so how anybody thought that was going to be sufficient. Um, just waving around a QC's advice done on that basis, uh, I'm not sure. There are other examples as well where there may be, um, in a particular value shift matter that we looked at, an issue about the valuation of um, a shared transfer. And there was an assumption made that the shared transfer was at zero value. But no person had been, no expert had looked at that. So um, that was a key underlying issue. The tax office came along and said, well, we think that's wrong. We've had a, a, our own value a look at this. Um, here's a $100 million tax bill. And so, again, why is it that when you're looking at those things and you've got some key assumptions that you aren't thinking about what else I need to be making this robust? Not necessarily just a legal advice or an accounting advice, but also any other expert advice that may be necessary to ensure that I've got a robust position when I'm dealing with this with the tax office. Um, the other issue uh, that arises in this context is uh, the issue of, of privilege and how important that is in your organisation. Uh, Stephen spoke about uh, this tax risk framework being in the context of corporate governance generally and one of the important issues I would think for all taxpayers is uh, the maintenance of privilege, the ability to go and get full and frank advice about uh, issues uh, across an organisation. Now, is privilege important for you and your organisation? Uh, it should be as important in tax as it is anywhere else. You need to understand, and we had the discussion about um, board tax risk papers, but you need to understand that in the context of accounting, a concession and uh, these board papers concessions, that we really are talking about something the Commissioner can undo. He gives it and he takes it away. So you need to think about, well, what process do I want to put in place to ensure that I can get full and frank advice uh, so that I can choose whether or not I give that over. Uh, and you can't assume um, that the Commissioner won't look at look for something like that either in the course of the, of the, uh, the audit or in litigation. Uh, we were involved in one case in which uh, it was a part for a issue. Um, there was advice from the accounting firm uh, that had put the taxpayer into the particular transaction. The Commissioner didn't ask for it uh, during the audit didn't ask for it at objection, but in the litigation he sought discovery of that material. Uh, now we objected to that on the basis that it was privileged because of the accounting concession and the Commissioner's argument was firstly he's asking for this as an ordinary litigant and so the accountant concession didn't apply, but even if that was not the case he then got the, uh, the uh, concession lifted by going to one of his SES officers and saying this is necessary, it's important because it's relevant to the consideration by the court of the particular matter. Uh, the matter ultimately settled, we did, we did attempt to take that particular decision on but, uh, but there is a risk that 
this could be seen at some point in the, in the chain as being something that the Commissioner should get access to and you need to understand therefore that there is a risk that's inherent in it and you need to be measuring what the consequence would be of the disclosure of that document as you're going through this process. Again, your tax risk framework should be putting in place something that says, am I comfortable with getting accounting advice here or do I need to get legal advice? And I think that's all I wanted to say at this stage. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, I mean, there's some pretty sobering news in amongst uh, what Peter uh, was really trying to articulate. Um, when you're at the pointy end, uh, litigation's always a, a horrible place to be if you haven't prepared well uh, in the past. Um, next up, we've got uh, our, um, Tony, uh, Tony, I'll have to get some help with your surname. Katsy uh, Garrick. There you go. Um, I'd rather do that than say it incorrectly and look um, even worse. Um, Tony um, is obviously with CCH and he's looking at uh, technological solutions. Uh, having been uh, head of tax globally, uh, I'm a very big fan of technical, technological solutions. Um, there's a lot that you can um, manage and avoid if you've got um, well-designed um, systems to pick up material at first instance and be able to report it in a sensible manner. Uh, so I think it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's quite appropriate that Tony sort of caps off. So stay awake for Tony as, uh, as he takes us through those things. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Andrew. Lucky me, I get uh, to stand between home time and drinks and dinner for 350 people. So I'll try and keep you engaged as we go. So as Andrew said, what I'll be talking about specifically is managing risk um, around compliance and technology. Now, I'm not going to be prescriptive. The, the temptation is to start sort of delving into particular compliance solutions or particular compliance. I'm going to try and keep it fairly generic. And really what I'm going to be focusing on is some of the key attributes and the considerations that you need to take into account when considering any system um, for managing risk um, and we'll sort of walk through that. Before we actually go through some of those attributes though, I'd like to work through I guess some, some principles or some understandings which sort of overlay I guess some of those considerations. So the first piece is why compliance, why focus on compliance? At the end of the day everything we do comes down to a, a handful of numbers. It's a handful of numbers that go to the regulator, they go to the CEO, to the CFO, to your board, they feed their way into your statutory accounts, they feed their way to, to shareholders and to the, market, the broader market in general. Ultimately, you want to make sure you get that right. So you want to make sure that all the, the risk management procedures around those are effective. The second piece is, is technology the answer? So a lot of people say, if we put a particular solution in place, will that solve all my problems? It's important to understand technology ultimately is an enabler, it's a tool, it's not a solution. There's a bigger picture, there's processes, there's governance, there's data integrity, having the right structure and so on. But the technology piece is actually quite an important piece in, in, in all of that and that's what we'll be focusing on today but always remember it's actually part of a much bigger picture. The third piece is, and it's one of the things that we're often faced with is people will say but we're really happy with, with what we have in place, we don't really need to change anything. When you delve in a little bit it becomes fairly scary because in the vast majority of cases people still use Excel to manage everything and to be in control of everything and yet the tax office will always come back and tell you that people that manage things through Excel inevitably will make mistakes as will some of the things that led into Sarbanes-Oxley and other, other initiatives. The other side of the coin even if you do have systems in place things change. The conversations I had with clients 20 years ago is different to 10 years ago and indeed they're different two years ago and I know in two years time I'll be having different conversations again. The world's evolving so you should always be reviewing what you're doing just to see it's current and just to see whether there's a little bit more that you can do. The next one's always the doozy. People look at the various solutions and they say but it doesn't do things the way we do things so we don't want to look at it. Ultimately it's not actually intended to do that. If all you're wanting to do is replace the system to do things the same way as you did it before, then why do it at all? Ultimately what you're doing is looking for a better solution, a way of actually doing things better, being more effective and reducing your risk to get the right answer at the end of the day. So the moment you start hearing yourself saying it doesn't do things the way we do things, you need to ask yourself the question, are we doing things the right way? Ultimately, 
your risk management framework around compliance is now actually no longer an internal issue either. So we talk about the, the risk differentiation framework. Sorry, I put uh, risk uh, management framework in the slides. I suppose I should bring those up to slide, up to date. Um, the ATO factors in a whole bunch of things that feed into your risk profile. And one of those is the effectiveness of your processes and your systems. So it actually, and that has a whole bunch of repercussions in terms of the level of activity and interaction you're required to have with the ATO and the amount of effort and work you need to put into it. Just to make things a little bit more interesting, many of you may not be aware, but in, literally in the last month, the ATO has tabled a new initiative called self-assurance. So first we had self-assessment, then the, the tax differentiation framework. We're now moving to self-assurance. And the basic precept behind self-assurance is actually moving the tax office to a whole new generation or a whole new attitude where rather than passively looking for mistakes and identifying potential for issues, they're actually looking to actively encourage taxpayers to put systems in place to avoid errors in the first place. And off the back of that, there's a whole bunch of initiatives, including little or no audit activity, signing off particular financial years, and a whole bunch of other things. Now, these initiatives will evolve over the next 12 or 18 months. So what you do has a very real impact on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. For those that have been through audits, I think you're all familiar with how much time and effort it actually takes to respond to those. So why not do things to actually counter it? Okay. So moving on to the attributes themselves. Obviously the key attribute is you want systems that will meet the compliance needs that you do. It's an obvious one. I'm not going to go through that in, in a lot of detail. Um, what I really want to focus on is the, is the, more, generic, the more generic sort of um, attributes. And you'll see all of those listed and we'll go through those um, <coughs> one at a time. What I'm going to do is I'll talk about the attribute, I'll talk about why it's important um, and what the benefits are. So the first one's a big one. Minimise the number of systems that you have in place. Ultimately, the benefit of that is the fewer systems you have in place, the more efficient you will be, the lower the risk. There's a number of different aspects to that. The first one is the fewer systems you have in place, the easier it is to manage and control that system. So many of you would come out of organisations that have multiple ERP systems, multiple compliance systems, multiple systems that do lots of different things. Each one of those systems needs a, a level of expertise to support it. The fewer there are, the more you can sort of focus and control that just that little bit better. The next piece is it optimises your ability to actually leverage the work that you do. It's amazing how many organisations have different systems that effectively do different steps in the same process. The very simple one is statutory accounting to tax reporting to tax return to PAYG. It's one and the same process and yet ultimately we often see people have different systems. Some use Excel, some use Integrator, some use a whole bunch of other different tools. Um, and often they don't talk to each other, so they replicate and they duplicate. The more you duplicate and you replicate processes, the, the higher the chance that you're going to get something wrong, the, the harder it is to audit and trace it back, the harder it is for you to, to make sure that you get it right. So the fewer systems you have and the more you leverage those, those um, functions, the, the higher the chances that you're going to get it right. Knowledge quality and availability. If you've got 10 people and 10 <coughs> systems, you're only going to be able to train those 10 people up to a certain level. If you've got 10 people and two systems, you can give them far deeper knowledge and they're going to be far more effective in actually managing the output from those systems. The other side of the coin as well is how many experts and professionals can you actually afford to come in and manage your SAP system or, or your compliance systems? Ultimately, the fewer systems you have in place, the more you can leverage and benefit from the, the expertise of external advisors. From a user security perspective, People come and go, and it is not unusual for people to actually leave an organisation and people to forget, forget to switch them off out of the system. In the old days, it probably didn't matter that much because most of the systems were in-house, so you couldn't get in through the network, you couldn't get into the system. But in the 21st century, most systems are now online. So what you don't want is somebody who is left to actually have, still have access to various account and data um, that they're no longer entitled to have. I personally have worked with people that have actually had access to online systems two years down the track when they should have actually been logged out um, and cut out of the system. So the more systems in, you have in place, you've got to manage all the people coming and going. So the, the greater the chance that you're going to miss somebody on the way through. The fewer the systems are, the easier it is to manage that security and control. In terms of project failures, if you can leverage an existing system, you're more likely to have a successful project rollout. So, 
there's lots of statistics around the number of IT projects that actually fail. And part of the reason they fail is because for any of you that have actually been through an evaluation process, it's quite a detailed and involved process in working out the appropriateness of the system, the capability, the functionality. Ultimately, something breaks along the way. Typically, it's because the people that are running the project also have their day-to-day -day job to do as well. As compared to being able to leverage an existing system where it's a known quantity and all you're doing is adding functionality. So again, if you can leverage an existing system, it just means your, your success rate goes up and the risk diminishes. And then ultimately, the fewer systems you have and the more those systems spread over multiple functions, the more you're able to actually start leveraging some data analytics. And data analytics basically says the ability to dig through and, and mine your data to look for trends to better understand your company and I guess make it easier for you to be able to pick up errors. So there's just some of the benefits of actually minimising the number of systems around that. So that's the first attribute. The second attribute is I guess leverage related processes and data. So I've already talked about that a little bit. The obvious one as I said is accounts, tax return, PAYG, tax reporting. The other ones as well is um, FBT, RFBA, payroll, workers' compensation. There's an awful lot of processes where the same core set of data actually feed into different reporting functions. So if you look at FBT, your FBT data actually also feeds into your reportable fringe benefits amounts, which ultimately feed into your payroll function, into your payroll returns. Um, and yet, when, as we do, when we sit down with so many different clients, it's amazing how many people actually have that in different job functions using different tools. FBT is probably the poorer example. The big cousins, obviously, tax reporting and tax returns. When you do an effective tax reporting, when you do your your um, your, your TEA at the end of the year, that should be 60 to 80 percent of your tax return. So why redo that on a on a different system? Why redo all the calculations? Why increase that chance of error? So the more you can actually identify related processes, and you can tie those into a common system the less error there will be, the more time there will be for you to be able to review and actually pick up any issues and errors on the way through. Maximise automation. I guess this one's stating the obvious. The more human intervention that's involved on the way through, the higher the chance of error. What you want to do is actually minimise that error. There have been independent studies that put transposition error rates at roughly 10%. The moment that you've actually got hands typing in formulas, that error rate goes up quite quite significantly. All of you would have been involved creating spreadsheets and I'm sure many of you have created nested if statements. So how long does it take you to actually get that right, get the bracket in the right place and how often do you miss that because you haven't actually triggered the exception that gives rise to the exception with, within that nested if statement. So the more you can minimise that and actually leverage a level of automation, the lower the risk, the higher the chances are that you're going to get it right. Ultimately, utopia would be not to actually have any manual intervention, but obviously that's impossible because at some point in time somebody has to enter a number. But the sweet spot is to get to a point where every, any particular line item or any particular data item is only ever touched once. That's utopia. If you ever touch once and everything after that is, is automated. That's where you want to get to. Okay, this one's a big one. Minimise the reliance of Microsoft Excel. So Excel is the beloved tool in tax, accounting, finance. And yet, when you look at Microsoft Excel, it's also one of the biggest source of errors. I have that statement up there that talked about, did Excel cause the GFC? About a year or a year and a half ago, there was a whole series of articles that talked about somebody making a calculational error in a spreadsheet, which worked out the wrong trigger point for the banks to start recalling all their bank loans. That trigger point came in too early. The banks started recalling their loans a little bit too early and that's what triggered the GFC. Now whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but that was the speculation that actually came through in all of these articles. The reality is that spreadsheets are fun. I actually even designed a house on Excel once. But the reality is that Excel is fraught with errors. If you've ever reviewed spreadsheets, it is actually quite rare to find one that actually is correct. You find things wrong in the formulas. You find people actually embedding numbers in their formulas and of course the next person comes along and forgets the, the, the numbers there and perpetuates that error on the way through. The issues involved with spreadsheets has been recognised by many authorities. It's been embedded in Sarbanes-Oxley. They've even brought out a whole discipline around SAS 70 and subsequent updates to those rules in terms of how you control and, and try and get some level of integrity from spreadsheets. 
the ATO, most recently, the part of the, the, the initiative behind self-assurance is around indirect tax. They got to the point where they said because people use Excel so much, the risk of error is inevitable, not because people want to make mistakes, but they will just because of the tools and the systems that they use in place. The interesting part is that when you sit down and you talk to CFOs and to tax managers and to accountants and to finance people, the first half of the conversation is always, look at my great spreadsheets. We do all these wonderful things, both for Australia and all over the world. And then as things quieten down, but everybody recognises the risks that are involved with that. So actually everybody knows the risks that are tied in with spreadsheets, but for whatever reason, people don't take the next step to move away from them. Now, ultimately, spreadsheets are, will always be there. There will always be things that you will do on spreadsheets. But if you're working in a large multinational or national organisation, spreadsheets should not be the backbone of all your reporting and compliance. So it should be in the peripheral. The, uh, one of the, the, the trigger points for, for spreadsheets, I guess, is the key person dependency. So over the many years I've been involved, I guess, in the system and specifically in, in tax systems um, since the 90s. And the conversation that sort of says, I love my spreadsheets, we're happy to run with this. And then suddenly a desperate call when the person who actually owns the spreadsheet leaves. So the thing to always remember with about spreadsheets, and particularly the really big model, is you've got a really huge key person dependency issue. What happens when the person who has managed and built in all these complex formulas and then built layers upon layers of complexity leaves your organisation. I've been designing and building spreadsheets for many years and I think I'm pretty good at it. But the reality is whenever I go back and look at the spreadsheet, the next person comes along, no matter how simple it is, they don't understand. So they pick up and they create yet another spreadsheet. So that's another one of the other big issues around Excel. There's other impacts as well in terms of version control and of course the negative impact it has on your risk rating. All right. The next one is your ability to view, audit and trace the source of your data. So there's a number of different aspects to this. It's the ability to be able to trace your disclosures back to your source data. It's your ability to trace the results of the calculation back to its constituent parts. They're the obvious ones. The ones that are a little bit less obvious are your ability to actually trace the reason you have applied a particular treatment. Do you have the notes and the query sheets and the comments that actually support a particular treatment and a particular number that appears in, in your tax return, for example? Or if a particular treatment is based on a letter of advice, how easy is it to actually find that letter of advice and actually reference that? So when you're looking at systems from a risk management perspective, anything that allows you to tie all of that together, anything that allows you to be able to drill down on a number and look back to where it comes from, Anything that allows you to double click on a comment and read why somebody treated it the way they did is going to aid you in your risk management process. The other type of, um, the other type of um, audit trail is the actual audit trail as well. So if something actually goes wrong, the ability to trace who did what, when. When did somebody actually go in and change a critical number that gave an incorrect result? So they're all the different aspects of an audit trail. So critical from a risk management perspective is actually for you to address all those different aspects um, to, to be able to audit and trace through your data. All right, just some other smaller tidbits. Um, workflow. The world's getting more complex, not less. As many of you will know, um, the world today in terms of your reporting is, is, is far more onerous in terms of what you need to do. 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have GST. We didn't have monthly PAYG instalments. We didn't have monthly tax reporting or quarterly reporting. It used to be a once a year process. Generally, most things were national. We might have had some international exposure, but now we've got a lot of international exposure. Um, we used to have a small number of entities. Now we have actually large organisations with people spread all over the country and in many cases all over the globe that we need to manage some kind of workflow tool that you can access that allows you to view where things are and the status of your activity is actually quite important just to make sure things don't fall through the cracks. It's quite a critical tool when you're looking at it from a risk management perspective. The next item is security. You need Whatever system you select needs to have an effective security system. Ultimately, this is the backbone um, that controls who can do what. What you want to do is to be able to give people access and 
authority that aligns with their capability and the authority levels that they have. When you look at the systems today, particularly the ones that are hosted, you're going to have people accessing it from all over the world. You want to be able to have a system that will actually allow you to control what they see, what they do, um, and uh, what they control. The next item we touched on a little bit earlier, which was data analysis. Um, ultimately, the more analysis that you can do, the better understanding you have of your organisation, the higher the chance you'll pick up discrepancy, discrepancies and errors. So when we talk about data analysis, it's simple things like comparing this year to last year. So when you're doing, think about your tax return, one of your review steps is actually picking up your numbers today, comparing it to last year and investigating any major changes or anything new or anything that's missing. Um, looking at trends, just looking for new things, looking for something that sticks out. So any tool that gives you that capability is a plus from a risk management perspective. Configurability and customization. Why is that important in terms of systems? Customization basically refers to a situation where somebody comes to you and says, we have a system, we need to build or program changes to the system to meet your particular needs. Configuration basically talks about a system that says, it's out of the box, but we give you lots of options to, to be able to cut and dice it in different ways to meet your needs. Whilst they actually same the same, sound the same from a risk management perspective over the medium to long term, they actually have very different outcomes. From a customization perspective, in year one you might get exactly what you want. But invariably customization is very, very expensive. Why that becomes important is because in year two you need to reach into your pocket and then in year three you need to do the same. Invariably what ends up happening is, sorry, we don't have budget. The moment you don't have budget, you start putting workarounds in place, typically Excel. As time goes on, those workarounds become bigger and bigger. Ultimately, you undermine the benefit of the system. Configuration moves away from that benefit, sorry, that, that, that problem, just fundamentally because you can actually change the configuration as you go without requiring expensive customizable programming changes to that software. So that's also a consideration. Last two points, I'm just conscious of drinks coming through at 5.30. Cloud or vendor hosted versus deployed on site and in-house versus vendor development. So looking at cloud and vendor hosted solutions versus deploying solutions on site. So there's a lot of pros and cons, I guess, that we, that we could talk about in terms of actually deploying a solution in-house versus externally. But from a risk management perspective and an effectiveness perspective, provided that you validated the vendor's ability to protect your data, there are huge benefits in actually having a vendor hosted solution versus running it in-house. And it really sort of comes down to one basic principle. When a vendor sells a particular solution, whoever that vendor may be, that's what they do day in, day out. So after a period of time, they become very good at it. They know what works, what doesn't work, they know how to address problems and they can do it fairly quickly. When you bring something in-house, even if you deploy it to the web as you can externally, the reality is there's probably one program amongst a hundred that your IT group has to manage. They may look at it once, twice, say three times a year. Every time they come back to it, it's a new, it's a new program effectively. They'll strike hurdles, they may get it wrong, it may disrupt you, you may not get the result that you want. We have many situations with clients where it's internally hosted, where by the time their internal IT is actually ready to roll it out and actually get it right, time has elapsed. They may not get the benefits that they need early enough. So that's, that's probably the key consideration so far as hosted versus deploying it internally. That's without sort of getting into other discussions around collaborative use and other benefits of, of hosted solutions. And finally, the other one was we often have a conversation with clients that says we're considering building our solutions in-house as distinct from buying something externally. Developing stuff internally always sounds very attractive. The reality is that in most cases when it comes to compliance, it's actually quite complex. Given my background in both tax and IT, I work, I guess, at the edge of tax, which is probably the fastest changing legal area, and technology, which just never stands still. When you're developing something in-house, you're actually bringing those two components internally and expecting that your IT people will be able to keep up and manage that. So ultimately, really, it's a, develop it, it's a question of scale um, and your ability to actually not only build but maintain it. The benefit of going with a vendor solution ultimately is, again, if it's all the vendor does, that's where they're focused. They throw all their expertise 
um, and background at it. They'll make sure that it's up to date and it's part of, I guess, their being alive to, to keep that up to date and keep you up and running. So that's, um, that's my session on compliance. Any questions? And unusually for a Greek, I'm spot on time. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, I, look, honestly, I think um, technology is sometimes uh, undersold and underthought about because we do tend to think about uh, legal um, analysis as being the starting point, but we tend to fall off as we go through to <coughs> the capture and the reporting processes. So I, I think they are really important things to take note of. So thanks again, Tony, for that. And also, trying to do that last uh, cab on off the rank is uh, is quite tricky. Um, just before we close, um, I, I do have a question. As it's the only one I've got, I'm actually going to ask someone. And Peter, you are the lucky person. My question is one that you've created or that's been put, put through. Um, I think you've caused some degree of concern by raising the idea of the accountant's concession being lifted. You might want to expand a little bit about that, otherwise you could be on front page news tomorrow. Um, well, I think my point was it can be. And uh, I'm not sure that I need to expand on it. Uh, there are also some issues, I think, about um, uh, the circumstances in which the Commissioner would actually think the concession applies. Uh, so there are, there's, a, there's a lot of... I think there's a, there's a lot in the accountant's concession that I think people need to uh, consider. Uh, my uh, experience has been that it's relatively rare that it is. But there are going to be circumstances in which it is, and so uh, you need to understand that if your uh, transaction or your responses somehow or other trigger um, something in the Commissioner where he thinks exceptional circumstances might apply, then uh, he will lift it. And there are also other issues um, where the document may come into the hands of the Commissioner other than through you. Uh, so there was, for example, in the Hogan litigation, um, a matter involving Mr. Stewart, where um, the documents actually came through um, a, another law enforcement body to the Commissioner, and the question, question arose about whether the concession would apply in such a circumstance if the Commissioner actually gets it through another means. So it's, it was just a, a warning about um, what's the nature of your issue. Uh, for example, if it's um, a, trans a transfer pricing issue, perhaps not, although I did see the Commissioner <coughs> seek to lift um, the concession in relation to a transfer pricing report that a big four accounting firm did. Um, he eventually walked away from that, but there was a, an issue that he wanted to look at. But certainly if part 4A is involved, or potentially involved, you have a significant risk. And so uh, I think, again, that's why I go back to be robust about your consideration of your issues uh, and to be realistic about whether or not the Commissioner might think part 4A is an issue, because uh, that's certainly going to be one of the areas where he will say, I want to look at the accounting advice. I, I don't think that's probably helped anyone, but... No, no, I think uh, that's helped to, I think, um, make that very clear if anyone was in any doubt around the nature of the concession and, and what it is in, in truth. Um, I think, uh, in just wrapping up, uh, um, just w walking through the presentations mentally from Stephen through Kevin, Peter, and then um, ultimately through Tony, there's, there's, a, there's a thing that really jumped out at me. Um, Stephen was talking about getting engaged with boards and, um, and doing things early and making sure that things are set up correctly. Um, Kevin is looking at open engagement, trying to make sure you understand where you are as soon as possible uh, with respect to your uh, relationship with the tax office. Um, Peter's looking at um, the most difficult point when you're trying to help someone out when they really haven't helped themselves earlier on. Uh, so there was, there was something, I think, that was pointing towards um, preparation and early preparation uh, in relation to all those themes. And then Tony's really caps that off as being something that you really need to early invest in a lot of these areas in order to minimise your overall cost. Uh, if, if I had to try and project, I think the benefit to you around engaging and getting the right professional advice early, uh, whether that's through the tax office, uh, through a relationship, or through other advisors and providers, um, if you don't have that facility in house, and I think it's smart to do that sooner rather than later, uh, including um, CCH platforms and whatever you may need to, to get there. 
So thanks very much, uh, speakers, once more, if you wouldn't mind putting your hands together, and then uh, I'll close there. <laughs> so, that's the end from me, but CCH would, would just like the opportunity for a brief retort as well. Okay, so just uh, just before we wrap up, just as on behalf of Maddox and CCH, or Walters Clure, as uh, will soon to be known as, um, just a small token of our appreciation to uh, for Andrew facilitating today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, that uh, draws today's proceedings to a close. Um, in the next 24, 36 hours, we will send through a, a survey um, and solicit some feedback on how useful you found um, today's session. Um, and beyond that, uh, we're having some drinks outside, so please join us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session. And for those that are dialled in at the webinar, have a drink on us at home as well. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> Bye.